eyes of the world shine upon us Set us free by the truth you now bring us Shine on me Shine on me Shine, Jesus
continually say to me, Mary is the Lord. I pray that you have a good time, that whenever you want to go, look at us, look at you in church, look at us believers, see and know who God is. Jesus, you have made us the light of the world. Thank you. When we step into any situation, your light will be here to us. Your light will be here to us. Thank you.
Yeah.
our visions, our dreams, everything we just give everything unto you, oh God. Lord, that you will use every one of us as an instrument for your kingdom, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. What a joy that we can always be in your presence and just worship you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your love, your goodness, your faithfulness to every one of us, oh God. Sometimes we do not realize how good you are, but you are good all the time, <coughs> Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We give you glory to you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. As a worship, let's just stay in offering. God shall be help us.
you don't need yourself to the devil. You must close the shop. Now I started wondering as to why I should, when ten pastors are not saying the same thing, what do I do? So I kept a fast. I told my wife, I'll keep a fast. Let's see. Lord will give me a vision or a dream or some answer. It so happened that whole night nothing happened. No dream, no nothing, no vision. Next day morning when she gave me a cup of tea, some tea spilled on my table. And then I picked up a piece of paper, gas slip paper. And I just rubbed the tea off and then at the back I read Isaiah 58. And when I read it, I got my answer. And I knew Lord answered me that way because I have to race through the testimony. You will have to read Isaiah 58, the last verses. The joy of the Lord is something where you honor Him. So, from that day, every Sunday we close. Now the problem is, Diwali comes on a Monday. What do I do? The temptation is too much to open. You know, 1 lakh rupees to lose the business and 30% profit to lose 30,000 on that single day. It was too hard. The very first time a Monday came, I told my wife, let's go to Kaimadal, let's go for a holiday. I spent money in fact. I took her for a holiday to Kaimadal. We honored it. And for your information, today is Sunday, tomorrow is Diwali. You know, this is again, I thought I must tell Pastor Jeff, I must share this testimony. Because over the years, 20 years, I close Sunday, Glory to God, because only He can give you the strength. Out of our flesh, we, I would have opened any, any amount of times. But 28 years have followed, all the market shopkeepers are shocked. They have always said, JC has gone mad. I'll just close the prayer in prayer. <laughs> Thank you, Father, for giving me the strength, Lord. Father, it was so difficult, so difficult, so difficult to even try to uh, even try to not open the shop. But Lord, you have given me the strength and the business has jumped double, triple, maybe four times today. So the other days you make up, even yesterday as a Saturday, generally we don't do such good sales. But yesterday you gave us that proper sales. Father, I thank you for that. Lord, today I just pray for the offering. You are the God who gives us the money to give back to you, Lord. We give in very, very tiny measure. But Father, let it be used for your expansion of your kingdom. And Lord, we know all those who gave with a cheerful heart. You will bless each one of them and bless the hands that have given. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Faces display your likeness, ever changing from glory to glory. Mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on well, we're still in the book of Acts, and uh, today we are looking at Acts chapter 20, from verse 28 to 38. And I want to ask you a question this morning. Do you like being healthy and flourishing? Yes. Yeah, I think a, a lot of people are just sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> and uh, nobody really likes to be sickly or weak or run down. We don't enjoy that. We don't like that. And I believe just likewise, <laughs> God wants His church to be healthy as well. He wants us to be strong. He wants us to be healthy. And there's a lot of things that go into making the church healthy and strong. The most important thing is that we need to recognize that Christ is the head of the church. And we as his followers need to submit ourselves to him. Now in Acts chapter 20 from verse 28 through to verse 38, Paul is meeting as we looked last week with the leaders of the Ephesian church and he's giving them his last words. 
he thought this was the last time he would ever meet with them. And so these words are very important. As it turns out, he actually was able to visit them again later, but he didn't think he was ever going to see them at this point of time in Acts 20. And so Paul gives him then the wonderful advice of how they can flourish as a church and as individuals. And I want to look at that today. I want us to apply it to our church, but also individually to our lives. How we can flourish in God. How we can do well in, in Jesus Christ. If we want to flourish as a church and individuals, we've got to be healthy. So how do we maintain good health in the church? Well, Paul gives us some good advice. So let's start reading from Acts 20, verse 28 to 31. I'll read first off. And what Paul is saying in this passage of Scripture is, Watch out. Watch out. He says, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you, and they will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. Be on your guard. Remember that for these three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. And so Paul's first declaration to us is, watch out. If you want to be healthy, watch out. Watch yourselves. We all need to watch ourselves. It's a challenge to every one of us. We need to watch over one another as well and we'll, we'll look at that. But as God's people, we need to watch ourselves and we need to make sure we are accountable to others. We're accountable to one another. I think, believe that a lack of accountability is one of the reasons there have been so many moral failures in the church and scandals amongst Christians and Christian leaders. Some Christian leaders think they are above scrutiny. They don't need to watch their own lives or have others watch them. They don't give anybody permission to speak into their lives. Maybe sometimes we're just so busy with life that uh, watching our own lives and particularly looking after others is just too much effort. It's, it's difficult enough keeping a track on ourselves. But we need to watch ourselves. We need people who can look into our lives and uh, can challenge us in areas of our lives. People are going to be looking at each one of us as we follow Christ, and some will imitate us. And so we've got to watch ourselves, because others are watching. And it helps us keep our relationship with God in order. The other thing we need to do is not only watch our own lives, but we need to watch over others in the church, like a shepherd watches over his sheep. We need to look after others. This has a lot to do with church leaders. You might say, well, I'm not a church leader. Well, if you're part of the body of Christ, you are a leader in, in the church of Jesus Christ. And so we have to watch over each other. I don't know if uh, you had siblings, but often older siblings are told to watch over younger siblings. <coughs> Excuse me. And sometimes that works out wonderfully. Other times it doesn't work out that great. As a matter of fact, with uh, my siblings, uh, my older sister was often put in charge of us. And as soon as my parents left the house, she would throw us outside and lock the doors. And uh, we would be locked outside, whether it was cold, raining or whatever, we'd be locked outside until they came back. So it wasn't such a great, uh, it, it wasn't such a great thing to have her looking after us. But uh, some uh, parents will often do that to get responsibility in their children, look after each other. They know that everything's going to come back to mom and dad, and mom and dad are going to sort out any troubles. But as the body of Christ, brothers and sisters, we need to not only be accountable to one another, but we need to be watching out each other. It's sad to me that sometimes in the church, people have seen others making wrong decisions, making wrong choices, and they've never addressed it. That's a challenge to us in the church. We need to challenge each other. We need to address 
those who are of veering off track because God wants us to grow. He wants us to keep healthy. Healthy. We need to meet the needs of others. We need to encourage others. We need to help train and help teach others. This is part of discipleship. It's part of the ministry of keeping a check on one another so that we're all growing in Christ together. So watch yourself and watch out for others. Be accountable to others, but also speak into other people's life. And then the third thing that I think Paul does very clearly here is not only saying, watch out, because there's going to come error, there's going to come false doctrine, but he also reminds us we, that we need to remember who is in charge. In verse 28 he says, Jesus bought the church with his own blood. The church belongs to him. And so often we think the church belongs to a pastor or a denomination. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. It's his church. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's his church. Jesus told Peter in Matthew chapter 16, he would build his church. And he didn't say he was going to build it on Peter. He said he was going to build it on the confession of faith that Peter made. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And the church is built upon people who make that confession of faith. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Every believer in the community belongs to God. We're all part of the bride of Christ, from the youngest to the oldest. It's not important in church for me to get my own way. And a lot of people struggle and argue and do little things so that they can get their own way. The important thing in the church is that Jesus gets his way in the church. Because it's not about us, it's about him. It's his church which he purchased with his blood. So a healthy church watches over its family members. A healthy church remembers that Jesus is the one who is in charge. And then a healthy church works hard. They work hard at a number of different things. Let's read from Acts chapter 20, verse 32 to verse 34. Now I commit you to God and to the word of His grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companion. Paul starts out this little section here by reminding us of God's grace, the word of His grace. And why does he remind us of that? Because it's the grace of God that builds up His people. You know, we can work hard and it doesn't matter how hard we work and how we try and make things happen. At the end of the day, it's all about God's grace. And results come because of God's grace. We talk about hard work, but we need to always remember His grace is the only thing that can accomplish anything in our lives and in His church. So Paul does speak here about working hard. He talks about working hard to avoid a covetous heart. He says, I have not envied or coveted anything you have. You know, I think covetousness and envy come from desire and not from need. You know, we, we see something that somebody else has and we want it. We covet it. We envy it. We desire it. And for most of us, it's not because we need it. It's just because we want it. I think all of us probably at times have been guilty of coveting things. We look at other, what other people have. Might look at a brand new motorbike somebody has or a, a brand new car that somebody has. I always had a little bit of uh, covetedness for uh, Kathy's ambassador cop and now she's gone and got rid of the cop. Um, but uh, I, I love that fear card. Look at it with glee sometimes. Uh, we look at people's houses, their wealth and other things and we might covet those things. And there's nothing wrong with admiring what other people have. 
So long as we don't become infatuated with them and wish they were our possession. Paul says he's strived, he, he has worked not to covet anything. You know, if you can't be happy for someone when they have something you like, you're probably getting close to coveting their possessions. Uh, somebody once said to me, when uh, somebody gets something good and you're fearing, feeling a little bit envious, pray that God will bless them again with the same thing. That they'll have double fold what they've got. And that will keep, keep your heart in check. But we can get so caught up with desire to acquire things that we miss out on God's purposes for our lives. And that's what happens with covetedness. We are, we're always envying what we haven't got instead of enjoying what God has given us and enjoying the, the, the bountiful blessings that we do have. So how do we learn to avoid having a covetous heart? Well, one way to learn is to have contentment. Contentment comes from trusting in God. And Paul told us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11 through to verse 13, he says this, I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Him who gives me strength. What a blessing it is when we learn to be content with what God has given us. And we're not coveting and struggling and, and, and desiring everybody else's things. But we just learn that great blessing of knowing that God is our provider and He gives us what we need. David knew that, and that's why he was able to write, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I think I've already told you this before, but a little boy once had a quote that for Sunday school, and he quoted it and said, The Lord's my shepherd, that's all I want. And I think it's probably the most accurate translation of that verse. The Lord's my shepherd, that's all I want. Because I have everything that I need. Everything I have anyway belongs to Him. And He will provide for my needs. So we work hard, not hard, not to have a covetous heart. We work hard to provide for our family. That's a biblical principle for us to work hard. 1 Timothy 5 verse 8 says, If anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for his immediate family, he's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, I want to say to you, God does provide for us, but God also wants us to play our part. He wants us to do what we need to do to uh, receive, earn a living and uh, help to provide for ourselves. Paul had worked hard. To provide not only for himself but also for others. I'm sure there were times where Paul would have loved to have dedicated himself completely to ministry but he still worked on the side so that he could support himself and he could support others. I remember when I went to Bible school uh, God had told me he would provide my needs and I had wonderful ways I mean that I told God he, how he can do it. And uh, generally they involved all on God's part, none on my part. And when I got to Bible school and uh, I started to realize I, I needed resources, I didn't realize God was going to provide it in the form of work. And uh, hard work as well. Digging trenches, washing dishes in a restaurant. My first holiday break uh, when I was in Bible school was working on a, on a piggery. And I did feel a bit like the prodigal son. You know, what? Where am I? I'm, I'm feeding pigs. And I did that from 8 in the morning till 5 in the evening. Feeding pigs. But it was the way God provided. Because when we do our part, God does His part. I remember another young man who was at Bible school with me. He said, God's called me and He needs to provide for me. And uh, there were a number of occasions where we said, look, there's some job opportunities. I'm not working. God's going to provide for me. And three months later, he was asked to leave the Bible school because he was not able to pay his fees. 
um, because he didn't want to do his part. God expects us to do our part. Paul could have very well received from the people he was ministering to. He had every right to do that. Some of the other apostles uh, received from the generosity of, of, of Christians. Paul really did. Perhaps the only time was with the Philippian church. There's nothing wrong with working hard to support yourself and your family. But there is a point where work goes to the other side as well. And as long as our job doesn't keep us from doing what God has called us to do, hard work is good. If your job consumes your life and you have no time for God, well then you've got to seriously assess your situation. Because God doesn't expect that to happen in our lives, where our work becomes overwhelming and the only important thing in our lives. And then the third thing Paul speaks of here is working hard to be able to support ministry. Paul took care of his own needs, but he also supplied the needs of his ministry team. There were many times where Paul actually raised funds to help the church, especially the church in Jerusalem, which was in great need. And it's biblical to support the work of the Lord. We support the work of the Lord with our tithes and offerings. And a good steward should never stop honouring God with what he has blessed them with. It's God's plan for us to give to the local church, to tithe. And there's a, a lot of people that have big challenges with tithing. I want to say to you this morning, friends, a tithe is barely the minimum of what we should be giving to God. Uh, that, that's, you're just paying for the air you breathe when you tithe. God wants us to be generous givers. I've never seen so many people have mathematical difficulties when it comes to tithing. I sat once with a, 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 a very educated man and um, he told me what his income was and he then he, underneath it the first thing that he said, this is my tithe. And I thought, am I mad or is he mad? Because it was about 2% of what he, he, he earned. Um, we need to be generous givers, and that's what Paul is talking about. We can give our tithe. We give our offering over and above our tithes. God wants us to be generous. And that's the very next thing that Paul says from verse 35 to verse 38. So let's read that. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of Jesus himself, as he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with them and prayed with them. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them the most was his statement that they would never see face to face again. And then they accompanied him to the ship. The last thing that Paul says to them is, be generous. It's better to give than to receive. And Paul had a great example in his life. He showed these people in practice how he worked hard and he was generous. We already see how he covered himself, but it says he covered his companions as well and looked after them. He worked to give to the poor. God loves it when his people are generous. Why? Because it reflects his own nature. God is a generous God. Stinginess is completely out of step with God's character. The Bible tells us God so loved the world that He gave. And He gave with no strings attached, unreservedly. And He gives and He gives and He continues to give to each one of us. He loves us and He keeps on loving us, wanting only the best for the people that he has created. And so as we seek to be good stewards, let's not think that God's impressed with tight-fisted hands. When we stand before God, he's not going to be impressed with what we've accumulated or what we've held onto. He's going to be impressed with what we've invested into his kingdom. Stewardship includes making sure that we get good return on our investments. That we're faithful in giving to God. I'm not telling you to give to God to make some preacher or some televangelist healthy and wealthy and living with excess. 
I'm telling you to give to where there is need, friends. I'm also not telling you in any sense that you need to give to Union Church. I'm just talking about a biblical principle of generosity, which God blesses. We want to all hear those words one day when we stand before Jesus. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful and you're generous with your worldly wealth that I gave you. Now come enjoy the true riches. They're going to last forever. And so as I conclude this morning, I want to say again, we want to be a healthy, growing church. We want to be living good lives for God. Well, let's remember these parting words of Paul to the Ephesian elders. Watch over God's people, including yourself. Watch out for one another. Work hard to avoid covetousness and greed and to provide for yourself and for others. Live a generous life with an open hand. Care for each other in the body of Christ. Remember that Christ is the head of the church. We want to be a church that is giving. We want to be individuals that are giving. Remember, if you need compassion this morning in your heart so that you can watch over others, God will give you that. If you need greater work ethics so that you can work hard, God will also give you that desire to work hard and be committed. If you tend to be a little tight-fisted when it comes to tithing and those in need, I can assure you God desires more than anything else to give you a generous and gracious heart like Himself. Well, let's pray and just ask, ourselves, ask the Lord this morning to make us more like Him in the way we live, in the way we conduct ourselves and as a church. Lord Jesus, we thank you today for your word to us. We thank you for the challenge of your word. We pray, Lord, that as your children, we will be people who watch out in our own lives and take care of our own lives, but also to watch out for others and to encourage and build up each other in our faith. We pray, Lord, that you will enable us to be a community that works hard. Hard so that we can provide for ourselves and our families, but also so that we can be generous to your work and to those who are in need. We pray that you will make us a giving, generous community, Lord, in all that we do. We want to be like you, Lord. We want to imitate you. Help us to do that. Father, I also want to pray this morning for all those parents who are here who will be traveling within the next few days. We pray that uh, you will give them traveling mercies, that uh, you will bless them as they go on their way, and uh, you will go before them, Lord, and prepare the way before them. We pray for Hebron School as they start this uh, new term that uh, you will just be with each pupil and staff member and bless them, Lord. May they walk in your ways, live for you and follow you and serve you. We all want to do that, Lord. Help us to do that better and better, day by day. We love you, we worship you, and we adore you, Lord Jesus. Take us into this week, and may we glorify you in all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining with us this morning, and uh, may the Lord...
The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this is the time when we remember something that happened in the past and something that is happening in the present and that will happen in the future. In the past, the Lord Jesus Christ was slain in the cross and he shed his blood for each one of us. So this time is the wonderful time when we can remember what all he has done on the cross. Also, right now in our life, in the present day, we are a privileged people to take part in this communion for what the Lord has done in the past. So with that confidence, let us examine ourselves before coming to the table of the Lord. Also, in the future, we have the guarantee that we will be in the eternal life with the Lord just because of what He has done on the cross and because we are taking part in this communion. So, dear friends, brothers and sisters, please come forward and take part in this communion. Let's pray before that. Thank you, Lord. Thank you so much for the privilege that you have given us to be a part of this uh, communion, Lord. Help us to examine ourselves before we take part in this communion. Help us lead a successful Christian life. Help us lead a life of Christ till we see you and till we be with you in eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to come forward as the musicians lead us in song and just cheer around the table of the Lord this morning.
faces display your likeness ever changing from glory to glory mirrored here may our lives tell your story shine on me shine on me shine Jesus shine fill this land with the Father's glory 